have been asked to speak on monogenic diabetes and at the outset let me state that i have no conflicts of interest relevant to this particular topic and i'll begin by talking about what is meant by monogenic diabetes now it's nothing but diabetes caused by inheritance of a mutation in a single gene now we all know that type 1 and type 2 diabetes and even some forms of secondary diabetes are all genetic in origin but they are polygenic that means just carrying a mutation or mutations is not sufficient for that individual to develop diabetes but there are many people who carry the mutations who don't have diabetes and there are many people who get diabetes who don't have the mutation but monogenic diabetes is somewhat different that means if you have that particular mutation you have that phenotype if you don't carry that mutation you don't carry that phenotype so this is actually an excellent example of mendelian inheritance autosomal dominant autosomal recessive and so on so how do you classify monogenic diabetes because as we all know the two main pathophysiologies of diabetes are insulin secretory defect and insulin resistance so we can have monogenic diabetes due to defects in genes involved in either insulin secretion or in insulin action now the conditions on the right side of the screen the monogenic diabetes due to insulin resistance i won't spend too much of time on those entities because number one they are extremely rare even more rare than the ones on the left and number two they generally do not present too much of dilemma in diagnosis because they have various extra pancreatic features that make the diagnosis easy i will concentrate over the next 20 minutes on monogenic diabetes due to beta cell secretory defect and monogenic diabetes due to beta cell defect usually presents as one of four phenotypes and this is important if you would like to select individuals for doing genetic testing you can't obviously test everyone with young onset diabetes for monogenic diabetes but these are some of the phenotypes which should raise the possibility that this individual is having monogenic diabetes and might benefit from genetic test so the first phenotype is neonatal diabetes the second is familial diabetes with an affected parent which used to be called mod1 mod3 in the old and good old days and the third is a mild non progressive fasting hyperglycemia which used to be called mod2 in the old days and then the fourth is there are certain syndromes associated with insulin secretory defect which have other extra pancreatic stigmata also many of which are monogenic in origin again these may not present too much of diagnostic dilemma because of the extra pancreatic features so let's talk first about neonatal diabetes now neonatal diabetes is diabetes diagnosed before the age of 6 months and why this is important is that at such young ages autoimmune type 1 diabetes is virtually unknown you can never say never in medicine so you can't say it's never seen but it is extremely unlikely so any patient diagnosed to have diabetes before the age of 6 months even before the age of 1 year whatever be the current age is considered to be having neonatal diabetes and there are two types of neonatal diabetes based on the natural history one is transient neonatal diabetes where the diabetes is there at young age persists for a short period of time and then disappears within weeks to months it might recur during adolescence when the insulin secretory resistance increases so that is transient neonatal diabetes mellitus or tndm and most of these are due to mutations in the chromosome number 6 the long arm of chromosome number 6 the other group is permanent neonatal diabetes mellitus where diabetes is there in neonatal period and does not go away and around half of these are due to mutations in the genes encoding the atp sensitive potassium channel which as we all know is an essential component of the insulin secretory cascade there are two subunits for the potassium atp channel kir subunit and sur subunit the the KCN J11 gene encodes for the KIR subunit and ABCC8 gene encodes for the SUR subunit. Mutations in either of these can result in neonatal diabetes. And the importance of finding this mutation is that you see here in this cartoon, when there is a mutation in either the KIR or SUR subunit, the ATP molecule cannot bind to the KATP channel, and therefore it cannot close the KATP channel. Insulin secretion does not take place. but if you give sulfonylureas they bind to the kdp channel at a distinct site which is not affected by this particular mutation and they can continue to close the atp channel so even in the presence of these mutations sulfonylureas can work they can restore insulin secretion and allow the patient to maintain euglacy so many of these children will be treated with insulin because nobody expects an oha responsive diabetes at such a young age 
So they would have been told they are having type one diabetes. They would have been put on lifelong insulin, and insulin really doesn't work in these patients. Sulfonylureas work much better. So if you make a diagnosis, you can actually shift the patient from insulin to sulfonylureas. That makes a big difference to the patient, and not only that, the glucose control is much better. As you can see in this particular case, this is a patient who presented to us from Calcutta, seventy-two day old female baby. She came with uh, young onset diabetes. She was taking three point five units of insulin per kilogram weight. You can just imagine, so very high dose. Sugars are all through the roof. Three hundred milligram per deciliter, four hundred milligram per deciliter. So once we got the genetic report, we started her off on sulfonylurea, relatively high dose for the weight. Insulin was stopped by day four, and see what has happened to the glucose levels. No glycine, no hypoglycemia, no hyperglycemia, no insulin, but relatively high dose of sulfonylurea. And this is not the only case. We have so many cases now which are there, which are published, and you can see the drastic response of these children to sulfonylureas. You can see the HbA1c is coming down from fourteen to seven, sixteen point six to six. Remember, these patients were on insulin. With insulin, the HbA1c was sixteen, fourteen, fifteen, like that. Just by switching them over to sulfonylurea, you are able to control the sugars beautifully without any hypoglycemia. And not only that. They are able to maintain euglycemia over a period of time. These are neonatal diabetes patients from our center who have been followed up for a period of five to six years, and we find that the fasting glucose levels are maintained absolutely beautifully with sulfonylurea even at the end of this period. These are children with KCNJ11 mutation, and similar picture of children with ABCC8 mutations also. No deterioration in glycemic control on sulfonylureas. We generally tend to think sulfonylureas are not durable treatments, and that's what is shown in the ADOP study and other studies in type two diabetes. But in contrast to that, when you give sulfonylureas for neonatal diabetes, the response appears to be more durable. And there is data from Europe also from Professor Hattersley's group, in which he has shown that the response to sulfonylurea is maintained over a period of ten years, absolutely beautifully. More than ninety percent of children are able to maintain euglycemia. With sulfonylurea without insulin over a period of ten years. So that's the importance of making a diagnosis of neonatal diabetes. You can switch them over from insulin to sulfonylurea. Now we have the second phenotype that is familial diabetes with affected parent. So earlier that used to be called one of maturity onset diabetes in the young type one and type three. And these are due to defects in transcription factors, and these transcription factors are needed for Normal development of the beta cell and normal functioning of the beta cell. Therefore, the diabetes caused by these defects is progressive. They are generally normal at birth. During adolescence, young adulthood, they develop diabetes. The two most common genes that have been implicated in this phenotype are HNF one alpha, hepatocyte nuclear one alpha, and H R hepatocyte nuclear four alpha. We will refer to as MOD three and MOD one respectively. They Constitute around one to two percent of all cases of diabetes in the UK. Probably slightly lower prevalence in our country, but if you take young onset diabetes, it may constitute up to around five to six percent of all cases. So we are missing a few of them. We are misdiagnosing them as either type one or type two diabetes and treating them inappropriately in many cases. There are many other rare forms also, but not all of them have been universally accepted as MOD subtypes. So MOD3 is the most common form of transcription factor monogenic diabetes due to HNF1 alpha mutation. They generally present in adolescence or young adulthood. There will be positive family history in three generations. That means the parent, patient, the parent, and the grandparent. And at least one other member of the family other than the patient would have had young onset diabetes, and they will be well controlled without insulin. They won't develop any ketosis until the late stages, and they resemble type 2 diabetes. Only thing it happens at young age, but they generally will not be obese. And will not have markers of insulin resistance. The interesting thing is that these these individuals, these young individuals, will have normal fasting glucose. When you give a glucose tolerance test, a glucose load, there will be a large increment in the two-hour glucose value. And oftentimes, the hyperglycemia is preceded by glycosuria because the HNF one alpha is also present in the renal tubules, and mutations in that can lead to renal glycosuria. And they are markedly sensitive to sulfonylureas even at a very low dose. Half tablet of glycoside, 30 milligram and all, will be more than enough for many of these patients. But diabetes is progressive. Many of them require insulin ultimately. In fact, there have been a few case reports in which long-standing MOD1 and MOD3 have even developed diabetic ketosis. Notwithstanding the old clinical criteria, which say that they cannot develop ketosis. 
probably if they live long enough and the beta cell function deteriorates to a sufficiently low degree, they can develop diabetic ketosis. And they are not immune to microvascular disease. Earliest, earlier concept was that monogenic diabetes, monogenic is a mild form of diabetes. They do not get complications. That is no longer considered correct. They are at as high risk of micro and macrovascular disease as type 1 and type 2 diabetes with the same degree of glycemic control. And MODI3 tends to have high HDL, low LDL, low triglyceride, but that has not been linked to any benefits as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned. MODI1 or HNF4 alpha mutation is very similar to MODI3, but it is much less common. They generally do not have renal glycosuria. They have an unfavorable lipid profile and they have a biphasic pattern of by diabetes in the sense that they may have hyperinsulinemia in utero and in the neonatal period, leading to macrosome. Babies who carry this particular mutation may be born macrosomic and they may get neonatal hypoglycemia. During childhood, they will be normal. During adolescence, the beta cell function deteriorates and they develop diabetes. So it's much less common than HNF1 alpha mutation. So if you are looking for a genetic screening, if anyone is found to be negative for HNF1 alpha mutation, that is when you will look for HNF4 alpha mutation. And this is what happens when you treat somebody just based on guidelines without looking at the individual characteristics of the patient. Now, this is again from Dr. Hattersley's series. Now, this is a patient with monogenic diabetes who was doing very well with sulfonylureas. You can see that even 10 years after diagnosis, the HP1C was being maintained around 5 to 6 percent with just a small dose of sulfonylurea. Then somebody saw this patient and said, looks like a type 2 diabetes, non-insulin dependence. Why are you giving sulfonylurea? Metformin is a drug of choice. They change sulfonylurea to metformin. And the HbA1c has shot up all the way to 10%. And it was around three or four years before the mistake was realized and the patient was put back on sulfonylurea. Fortunately, the sulfonylurea still worked and the HbA1c came back down to around 5.5%. So it's very important to individualize treatment in these cases, not, not just go by guidelines. Just because you don't need insulin doesn't mean that metformin is the drug of choice. And does it make a difference when you make the switch? See, somebody is being treated as type 1 diabetes and you want to switch them over to sulfonylureas. Does it matter if you make the switch after 10 years of the onset of disease or is it essential that you switch them as soon as possible? The answer is that the earlier you switch a patient with monogenic diabetes from insulin to sulfonylurea and the lower the HbA1c at the time of switch, better will be the outcome. And this is because when you delay the switch, because of all the ineffectual treatment that the patient would have got, the beta cell starts getting exhausted, such that even if you make the switch later on, the beta cell is unable to respond. So if you have a suspicion of monogenic diabetes, actionable monogenic diabetes, please do not hesitate, please do not wait to do the genetic testing, because you should try and switch them over from insulin to sulfonylurea as soon as possible. But there are certain other forms of monogenic diabetes, MODI, which do not respond to sulfonylurea. The ones which do respond to sulfonylurea are MODI1 and MODI3, which I have already mentioned. There are two other forms known as MODI11 and MODI12 and MODI13. Now, see, these two are due to mutations which have already been implicated in neonatal diabetes. And I told you, children with many children with these mutations with neonatal diabetes can be switched over to sulfonylurea. Same gene, different mutation can present as MODI. And they have been called MODI12 and MODI13. They also respond to sulfonylureas, but many others do not. So you need to make your treatment decision based on the reports of the genetic test. That is true not only for MODI, but also for neonatal diabetes. Because there are many forms of neonatal diabetes, for example, the insulin gene mutations. These do not respond to sulfonylureas. So if you find an insulin gene mutation, you have to keep the patient on insulin itself. There is no question of switching over to sulfonylureas. The third phenotype is a mild fasting hyperglycemia, otherwise known as MODI2. And this is due to mutations in the glucokinase gene. Now, we all know what the function of glucokinase is. It is the glucose sensor of the beta cell. So, the glucokinase is what tells the beta cell how high the plasma glucose is, how high the extracellular interstitial glucose levels are. So, if you have an inactivating mutation in the glucokinase, it will not tell the pancreatic beta cell to excrete, secrete insulin until the glucose level goes very high. But once it starts telling the pang beta cell, then the beta cell can function normally because there's nothing wrong with the beta cell. It's just a slow starter. So this is glucokinase defect. And generally, these people 
have diabetes from birth, but because it is so mild, they're usually not picked up. And they're usually picked up the first time they do a blood glucose. Do a fasting blood glucose, they find the fasting glucose is high. It may be during childhood, it may be during adolescence, it may be during pregnancy, it may be even during old age. So depending on when they do the test, the diagnosis can vary. Type 1 diabetes, GDM, type 2 diabetes, and so on and so forth. Fasting glucose will be disproportionately high, but not very high. After glucose load, the two-hour value will not go up very high. It's the exact opposite of MODI 1 and MODI 3. You generally don't need to treat them. And if you, even if you treat them with insulin or subfamily, it doesn't really make a difference to the patient because the glucose level will remain high. And they are not at any high risk of complication. But remember that these people are not immune from type 2 diabetes. As they grow older, they may develop type 2 diabetes also because so common in our society, isn't it? So always keep a watch out for development of type 2 diabetes in these individuals. The fourth and final phenotype of monogenic diabetes is diabetes with extra pancreatic features. There are so many syndromes, most of which are exceedingly, exceedingly rare and most of which do not pose any diagnostic challenge, but I'll just mention a couple of them. The first one is due to HNF1 beta mutation. Same hepatocyte nuclear factor, but 1 beta. Now, this particular factor is present also in cells of genitourinary tract. It is also there in the exocrine pancreas. So, if you have mutations of this particular gene, you can get not only young onset monogenic diabetes, but you can also get defects in the genitourinary tract. And these may be in the form of multiple renal cysts, during dysplasia, horseshoe kidney, and so on and so forth. Just last week, we picked up one case of uh, MODI5 HNF1 beta mutation in a girl who was diagnosed to have polycystic kidney disease. She had polycystic kidneys, but the clue was that she also had pancreatic atrophy on the ultrasound at the time. So that is how we picked up uh, MODI5 in this case. Unfortunately, these children do not respond to sulfonylureas. They have to be given insulin and most of them actually get into trouble not because of diabetes, but because of the genitourinary defects. And there are so many other syndromes of monogenic diabetes. I already mentioned about HNF1 beta. It's called the ARCAD syndrome, renal cyst and diabetes syndrome. We also have defects in the mitochondrial genome, which as we all know is maternally inherited. So many syndromes are there, mid, MELAS, MERF, Kiemsair syndrome and so on and so forth. Exceedingly rare, but they have maternal inheritance. Then you have the famous Wolfram syndrome or Dittmode syndrome, diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, optic atrophy and deafness, which is again autosomal processing. You know, these children need insulin. And then this is this interesting condition known as thiamine responsive megaloblastic anemia or Rogers syndrome, in which this is one situation where B complex is therapeutic. So that's why it's called thiamine responsive. We give supraphysiological doses of thiamine. Not only the extra pancreatic features will improve, but the diabetes may also improve. But extremely rare conditions. We don't have to worry too much about them in our clinical trials. But the point to be made here is that many a time, and this has been published just a few months ago by again by Dr. Atresley team, in many of these conditions, diabetes may be the first feature. So if you just, because they don't have any other extra pancreatic features, if you don't test for any of these genes, you just test for the normal Modi genes, you will give a negative report to the patient. That should not be done. When you're testing for genetic defects, you should test for everything. That's why nowadays people use gene panel. 70 genes, 80. I think we are doing around 78, 79 genes for all these children. So if you get it positive, you can at least tell the parents, you can tell the patient the prognosis, what is likely, what to be looked out for, and you can also do some genetic counseling. So many other syndromes are there, Walcott trilysin and so on and so forth. So why do genetic testing for monogenic diabetes? Again, differentiation from type 1, that is the most important. You can avoid lifelong insulin, you help to define prognosis, help to counsel the family, and you can help in the treatment decisions. So, who are the patients who should be referred for genetic test? And in an ideal world, every young onset diabetes should be referred. But we are not living in an ideal world. Genetic testing is not available in most of the country. Even if it is, nobody can afford it. So, we have to select the patients. So, who are the patients to be selected? Neonatal diabetes, it is mandatory to do genetic test. Because we find that in 30 to 40% of neonatal diabetes, you'll be able to find some mutations, many of which respond to sulfonylurea. So the yield of testing for genetic mutations in neonatal diabetes is quite Then people with type 2 diabetes who don't look like type 2 diabetes. The family history is there, they have small dose of insulin, no DK. There they may be having HNF monogenic diabetes. You may be able to switch them to sulfonylurea. Mild fasting hyperglycemia, GCK mutation, you can stop the treatment. And of course, in syndromes to explain the prognosis. I would say that is the fourth and least priority. So this is our team. I always say they do all the work and I do all the speaking and I get all the credit. I'm not a geneticist. 
you ask me some technical details about how to test the genes, I have absolutely no idea. I'm very sorry. But I can put you on to them and they'll be able to answer it better for you. Okay. Thank you. And let's uh, have some questions for your time or else we can wait to the end of the session.